You're not competing against yourself. You're just building a brand of your own in your own area. So who doesn't want a business with these characteristics? TV. Today, I have two very special guests who are going to share their inspiring journey of building their franchise to the first 100 units, a feat that is not an easy thing to do, especially when you have a business that costs a lot of money to build and it doesn't qualify for traditional SBA lending. Today with me, I have Jason and Sean Olson, the founders of Image Studios 360, a salon suite. Jason and Sean, welcome to Kim Daily TV. Good morning. Good morning. We're just happy to be here. Well, we're going to talk about the road to the first 100, but before we do that, you know, The Daily Coach is all about sharing inspiring stories and the good news in franchising. And the one thing I've learned in all my years of business is that people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. And I want all the Kim Daily followers to know, like, and trust Jason and Sean. So before we begin, why don't we tell, if you guys could tell my listeners, one fun fact Keep it clean, Sean Olson. Oh, man. <laughs> a, fun fact, a fun fact that your mother knows about you. We'll put it that way. Man. Wait, so- a fun fact that will help the followers feel like they know you a little bit more than just who you are professionally. Woo! I tell you what. So this has got to be PG-13, right? <laughs> exactly. Luckily. And that means, Jason, you answer the question. <laughs> right. I go first, all right? <laughs> what do they say? Oh, no, age before beauty. So please. Okay. Um, and just for the record, I'm like a year and a half older, so I'm not that much older. But I, I have two fun facts I'll share real quick. But first one, when I was eight years old, I entered a contest uh, that Marie Callender's had on the back of a box of a pot pie. And it I was, remember that. <laughs> it was to submit a piece of artwork of a Marie Callender's product, and you could enter in a chance to win a trip for your entire family to Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm. So I did a watercolor of a Marie Callender's pot pie and I won and little did they know our family of eight got all paid and all expenses paid trip to <laughs> Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm. And I'm sure they were kicking themselves when they awarded this because they were like, who has the eight people in their family? Wait, so you guys have one of these really traditional Utah families with eight children? Yeah, yeah. multiply and replenish. Well, there, there's 10 kids in the family, but only eight in the house at that time. Yeah. <laughs> So how what, many we, total in the family? Ten. And what number? So how do you guys fall in the order? We're right in the middle. Right in the middle, yeah. The forgotten children. So I have another fact to share. <laughs> All right, before sorry. I get sorry. <laughs> so uh but about twelve years ago I got my pilot's license um while I was in college. And what I actually it was about 16 years ago now that I think about it, because I was not in college that, that short time ago. But um, that was probably one of the greatest things I think I did for me in business, though, because learning how to fly, you have to think of contingencies, backup plans. You're always looking for where you're, you know, where can you emergency land? You go through emergency procedures, you're practicing what ifs. And it was weird. After I got my license, I just realized how much better I thought through things just because you're challenged to think constantly about all sorts of scenarios. And so um, I, other than being able to fly, which is a ton of fun, but it had a lot of other things that I noticed that have been really helping in business. And it's just, it's a, that attention to detail, which I think has been great. Sean. I mean, full disclosure, <laughs> full, full disclosure, Kim, he's always thought like that. He just realized when he started flying planes, <laughs> that he does think like that. So <laughs> Fair enough, fair, whatever I talk. Hold up, wait. Do you have anything to say, Sean, before I move on? Oh, no, 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 trust me, I got something to say, all right? I had shamans, uh, Peruvian shamans um, that lived in my basement for two years and they did ceremonies, um, like traditional healing ceremonies for people um, in my basement. And that was wild, that was awesome. I mean, I had every week I'd have like seven to 10 people I didn't even know coming through my house. And then every morning I'd have seven to 10 people crying on the way out, like tears of joy, by the way, not anything bad, but um, 
So anyways, that is my fun fact. Like it's, it was such a crazy, cool thing. Did you ever go down there for a healing? Uh, 87 <laughs> times I did. <laughs> and look at me now, girl. Look at me now. <laughs> That's how you're so perfect now. I got it. I got it. I got it. Let's kind of back up and talk about your entrepreneurial journey. When did you become business partners and how did you start? Like, how did you get into real estate and salon suites? So the interesting thing about Image Studios is that it wasn't birthed out of boredom. It was birthed out of fear. And that fear moment came in 2008, which I think we all remember the Great Recession. That was a really fun time. <laughs> we, we all learned a lot about ourselves, right? <laughs> um, so we were at that point in time, um, our background is oddly enough, car dealerships. Um, you couldn't have two more, in my opinion, um, contrasting businesses like the car dealership and then you have salon suites, just completely different in every aspect, every way. So anyways, uh, recession hits and the last place you wanted to be in business was probably besides homes was in the car industry because it's the second big, biggest expenditure a household makes. And it's the worst depreciating asset known to mankind. Whereas a home, you can at least recuperate some of those losses if you sit on it, but a car, no, it's just going down, down, down. So um, when the recession hits, people don't buy cars, they fix cars, which is awful for our business. And so me and Jason were worried sick. It was like a big punch to the gut because it was, it was a ghost town here at the dealership and all of our eggs were in this one basket. And so we started to really panic. We were like, we have to diversify. What can we do? Like, we have to find something else to, you know, just, just take some of these eggs out and put them over here because it was too scary to have this, this one big, which by the way, dealerships are awesome. It's a feast or famine business. When it's great, it's great. But when it's bad, it's awful. So we're looking around at everything and anything. And about three months pass by and still business is non-existent. And one of our friends comes in who's a stylist. And she plops down a bag of cash on her desk, like a literal bag of cash. And she looks at us and me and Jason, by the way, are about to fall asleep at our desk. It's that slow, right? We're calling the dealership every day to make sure the lines work, you know, like with our cell phone. This is, it's awful. So anyways, um, she comes in, plops down this bag of cash and she's like, I want to buy that Escalade out there. And it's just beautiful Escalade, like close to brand new Escalade. And me and Jason are foaming at the mouth to sell a car because like, we just want to, something needs to happen, Right. But she's a friend of ours, so being concerned friends, we kind of said, hey, I don't know if now's the best time to make this big purchase. Maybe you should hold off and just see how this whole recession plays out. And she looked at us funny, and I'll never forget like the deer in the headlights look she gave us. And she was she said, I I've heard about the recession, but I don't really know what's going on. And me and Jason were like, What? what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean you don't know what's going on? Because it felt like the sky was falling for us. Um, and we asked her, we said, how's business? And she said, it's never been better. She says, I'm booked six to eight weeks out. And so that was like the initial light bulb moment for me and Jason. We realized at that point in time, literally within about 10 seconds, the beauty industry is what we had to get into because it doesn't matter what's going on in the economy. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. Like people still, especially women want to get those services done and they will sacrifice a lot of things before they let those things go. Right. And so we realized this is probably the closest thing to recession proof that we could find is the beauty industry. So for about 20 seconds, we contemplated being hairdressers, but I don't want to stand on my feet all day. And the other problem was this, Kim, we already had a business. We had a full-time day job that we had to tend to and babysit. So we couldn't afford to actually, I guess, buy another job. We, right? didn't, we didn't have the luxury of time, right? Yeah. It's like we, we already had a job that committed us. And so we, we had to really get creative on flexibility freedom and yeah i mean and just on that part too which i think is really important we have, i have always heard and i'm sure sean has and i'm sure a lot of your listeners have too you know during the great depression um one of the things that skyrocketed was lipstick sales and it was because there was it was one of the things that people could still afford to purchase that made them feel good about themselves but you can't you know in the great recession you couldn't remodel a kitchen buy a new car go on a trip fix yeah. your yard, put in a pool, these things that people love to look forward to do. You can't do any of that right now, but could you spend a little bit of money and go look good? And that's why beauty has always outperformed almost every other industry besides the alcohol industry during depressions or recessions. Um, and so that, that was where like, we just, we were determined, how would we get, how do we get into this? How do we figure out? And then she ended up tuning us into this new concept that had just come into Utah where she was renting this room in a warehouse. It was nothing pretty. 
I remember we drove well, up to see it. We have to say though, it was a national salon suite chain. So we're not going to name names here, Kim, but we walked into this place, by the way, and we were to Jason's point. We were like blown away. Number one, we walked in the place is packed wall to wall. I mean, it's alive, it's bustling, it's loud, and we're comparing Sound that like to your the, dealership. The dealership's the closest. <laughs> no, seriously. seriously. By the way, did you sell her the Escalade or what? She had the money. <laughs> she ended up buying it. Well, she ended up buying it. But yeah, so we'll talk about that later. But yeah, we're comparing that to the to the dealership, which is like a ghost town, and we're like, this is crazy. Like this place feels like a completely different world to us. But we were really underwhelmed with the execution of the concept. I mean, it had carpet on the floor. It a drop like drop ceilings. It just looked like a stale doctor's office. Like I felt like I was going in to get a checkup, you know, <laughs> like I didn't feel like I was going in to get a haircut or even in a salon. And so at that point in time, time, me and Jason realized like we can absolutely execute this better, but because it was such a foreign industry and niche to us, we wanted to make sure we did as much R and D as possible. Uh, because in our experience in business, the only way you're successful is when you differentiate yourself from the competition. So we took the next year and a half, um, to literally fly out and we visited close to 40 locations. And the goal was to interview stylists at each of these locations and figure out what is it that you aren't getting today that you really want, right? Where are the holes in this boat? Like, what is this whole thing missing? Because we, even though we weren't from the industry, just our, our that one experience walking in the salon, we realized there's something missing. This isn't right. And we found out three things. Number one was aesthetic value, like design. They wanted a place that reflected what they do. And stylists consider themselves to be artists, which might sound a little bit weird, but when you think about it, they're, they're dealing with the most intimate part of your body, your face, right? They're beautifying people, beautifying. They want a space to reflect that. They want a beautiful space. They weren't getting that. And then support, almost everybody felt like as soon as they signed a lease, they were just left to fend for themselves. And, and a lot of people, I think everybody at, at the core wants to be in charge of themselves as far as be their own boss and create their own schedule. But you also want to feel a part of something bigger, right? You want to feel a part of a tribe, a community. And they didn't have that. There was none of that. And then lastly was ongoing education. They didn't have any of these tools to help keep them on top of their game. Because as you know, the beauty industry techniques, trends are always evolving and changing. So you have to stay up to date on what's going on um, in order to be relevant, right? In order to keep being the best at what you do. Um, so anyways, we took those three things. We came back a year and a half later and we opened up our first one in June of 2010. And to our surprise, in six months, it was 100% full. And we were just tickled. We were like, wow, this is crazy. But we did what we came to do, which was go, go. Can I ask a question just to interrupt you? So for those viewers who are tuning in and they're like, yeah, but what is it? What is it? So a salon suite is, in general, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. so salon suites are a lot like executive office suites, similar to WeWork, Regis, Office Evolution, where... Um, instead of individual office suites, we build individual salon suites. So they're uh, rooms that are 100 to 250 square feet. They're all built out. They're turnkey mini salons for one or two people to come and operate their own business. So imagine the size of a blockbuster. We all know what a blockbuster is, about five to 6,000 square feet. Um, that's our average space size. We go in, we then build out 28 to 32 individual salon suites. So you walk in and it's this beautiful, it's almost like a mini mall of hair salons, nail suites, aesthetic suites. Um, we do lots of beautiful design, high ceilings of European glass, um, some really nice fixtures and furniture to really make the space feel like something you'd see in LA or New York or Miami. Um, but we do it on a good budget. Um, you know, from the very beginning, one of the things too, when we opened that first location, we didn't know what we were doing. We made, you know, on the surface, we thought this is easy. You'll just, we'll just design it like, you know, here's how many studios and all this. Well, we felt very short on money because we didn't have any money at the time. We were, this, our other business was heading towards bankruptcy and we were, we were terrified, but we were so determined to do this. We took out, was it eight or nine credit cards? It was more than that. Anyways, I lived off ramen noodles for like two years, Kim. We, no I mean, we literally, there, when there's a moment where you I'm put. I'm to start a franchise, okay? <laughs> <I'm> not, <laughs> But when you <laughs> bootstrapping it, bootstrapping it. Yeah, I mean, but this is where like we we just we we had to figure out a way. We just knew whatever it took, we wanted to change what our situation was. And you know, and and in hindsight, that's not a smart thing to do in any in any business. And now we've got lots of great financing available that's extremely great rates. Um, 
to do things like this. That's what you're selling, not to interrupt you again, but that's what you're selling, right? So you thought you could go do it on your own only to do it and go, oh my gosh, it's harder than we yeah. thought. And so when you think about like the simplicity of this almost real estate play, oftentimes candidates will say, well, where's the value of a franchisor in that? And the value is in what you just said in your story. So candidates who are listening to this, this is why there's always a value proposition in a strong franchise. And it's through the due diligence process that you're going to really be able to figure out what that value proposition is. Don't assume oh, this is too, too easy. I don't need a franchisor. Go through the due diligence process and find out the facts because these people made all the mistakes that cost them the money and the time and, you know, that they can like give you that learning curve for that franchise fee so you can get to that break even of that, you know, fully rented salon suite that much faster. Yeah. I mean, if you can, if you can improve Amen. revenues and bottom lines, you know, eight to 10%, um, through a competitive advantage or more than that, which is usually the case when you look at a streamlined business model that's been well proven out, like that speed and efficiency to profitability and combined with the, the very costly mistakes we made. Um, you know, and the other thing I remember when we had our third or fourth location open, you know, we at that point had learned quite a bit, but it, now the stress of all this accumulating was coming together. And I remember telling Shana, it just, it felt so lonely. Well, who, who do like we didn't have anyone to talk to to help collaborate, to share best practices or how are you doing this? Like we every single problem that arose was a new problem we had to solve, which we enjoyed doing. And I think that's what entrepreneurs are programmed to do. But we also realized like we could also be you know moving quicker if we had collaboration. And that's part of what I love with the with the image owners network is the amount of brilliant minds that are now a part of this across the country. We're all collaborating constantly to continually, you know, our, our mantra has always been, we don't want to be the biggest in this industry. It's never been our desire, but we absolutely will be and are the best that's out there. And that's where we're committed to making sure this is the most exclusive model uh, with the best support and training for the professionals, but also for our image owners, because this is a tribe they get to be a part of. You know, and that's really powerful too, because being in business is very lonely sometimes. And entrepreneurship is very lonely and oh, yet yeah. franchising is so collaborative. So that's yeah. another buy-in. We talk about that here on Kim Daily TV. Okay. So, so you get past your four and you decide to franchise yeah. it and then. Well, let me just say, I remember at the fourth location, I remember Jason, to your point, like when you joked about, you should just bought a franchise. <laughs> it was about the fourth location because you're still, <laughs> you're making massive mistakes along the way, by the way, right? You think the next one, you got it. And then you realize, oh, we're not even close. Anyways. It was about the fourth location, and Jason was like, "We should just franchise." <laughs> Bought a franchise, you know. But at this point, at this point, though, we're in too deep, right? We've already done this. We've already gone this far. We might as well just take it farther. And and to your point, when you buy a franchise, what you're buying to me is you're buying the lemons that someone else has turned into lemonade, and so you don't have to worry about that, right? You just come in, you, you grab that glass and start drinking. <laughs> and so, anyway, so yeah, so we open up fifth location, and I think that was kind of the next aha moment for us when we had our fifth location grand opening five locations in five years. So is this yeah, marathon every year, growth. every yeah. year we just kept doing it because we kept getting calls from people we didn't know asking when's the next one coming. And so we realized there was a huge demand for this. And the fifth location is when we kind of had our, once again, our second light bulb moment. It was, we were comparing the dealerships to image studios, right? We have 70 plus employees at the image uh, dealerships and it's like glorified babysitting Kim. It's like grown adult daycare, right? It's awful. And we're comparing that to the Image Studios, which have, we have five rooftops and about 190 stylists underneath those rooftops. And we have one full-time employee and we have one part-time handyman. And all the employee did was sign leases and give tours. So at this point, that's when we really changed our trajectory and said, hey, we're going to focus and put our, our, our energy towards this, right? Towards Image Studios, because that's the end game. That's going to give us the freedom we want. The dealership is just a, it's honestly, it's, your, it's a job. You have to be there. So anyways, at that point in time, that's when we decided we're franchising Yeah, because this, to, at that point in time to the fifth, the fifth location, we really felt we had nailed this down. And now you're just over a hundred units. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's a huge milestone in your business because getting to that was really hard, right? Because your business, oh, yeah. since the SBA only loans money to businesses that 
create jobs. In my understanding, that was one of the biggest, you're not creating jobs. So how do you get SBA funding, which pretty much meant that people had to come to the table with cash. And, you know, myself being one of the biggest supporters of your brand, I mean, I love salon suites. I work with investors every single day. Who doesn't want a business with these characteristics, right? No employees, right? You have a finite amount. You you know when you're fully at your capacity. And like you guys built five in one market. When people are like, look at a market and go, I think it's saturated. It's like, no, because there's only 25 or 30 renters in there. And how many hairstylists are there in your area? So you can keep growing and you're not competing against yourself. You're just building a brand of your own in your own area. So who doesn't want a business with these characteristics? The tripping point that everybody kind of was started to trip over though was how do I afford this? So what does getting to a hundred units mean now for all of the candidates who are now coming to the idea of Image Studios? Yeah, you know, it's it, a lot of doors open as as we grow as a brand. You know, one of the big ones has been financing, getting um, some really good conventional financing in place that gives people the option to go for five hundred, six hundred thousand or more. Um, for a first location, um, typical investment for one location will range anywhere from 700 to 900. Um, and so they're able to do 60, 70%, maybe even more financing on the total project cost. You know, it's 6.9 to 8.1%. It's so it's very, and it's fixed interest. So, I mean, a very good, very conservative, um, source of debt. Um, to leverage instead of cash, which is great. But, you know, it took us a long time uh, to to work with lenders and get them to see our vision, our growth trajectory. And 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 to be honest, at the end of the day, a lot of people love love the vision and stuff, but they want to see that you do what you say you're going to do. And so we had to be diligent and almost relentless with these lenders and say, I mean, for years, just kept, hey, Hey, I'd call, I'd call them every two, three weeks, just check in. I'd share them updates, but just let them know, like, look, this is our goal for the year. I'd follow up and say, guess what? We achieved our goal or we exceeded our goal for this, that, and the other. And, and I think they started to fall in love too, with our story and our, you know, the path of, of, of getting to that hundred and more. And, um, and, and again, it's, you know, b- bankers and investors, their first concern is I just want to make sure that the borrower is going to pay right. me back. Right. Right. So they, they need to get comfortable with with who's borrowing. They need to get comfortable with the brand. And we really were able to do that. But in addition to that, we've got some great training, national training programs for salon professionals. We have uh, modules that help professionals learn how to plan for retirement, how to save, how to understand the power of compound interest to retire a millionaire. Um, these are these are professionals that never thought they could retire with a million dollars or more. And the reality is, is it's actually extremely easy to, but you have to be disciplined and save and, and take and leverage compound interest. We teach them how to understand break even and all these other business fundamentals. They don't learn in beauty school, but, um, but it's very powerful for them. And our philosophy is the more we empower them, the, the more loyal they are to the brand. And we're seeing that because they know that image is the place that really is where to go if you're a career rock star hairstylist or beauty professional. So your your investors really then are becoming mentors to business owners rather yeah. than babysitters to employees, they're becoming yes. mentors mm-hmm. to business owners. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's such an inspiring story. And one thing about um, you know, Jason shared the average investment, but listeners, don't again, don't trip over that because Talk about what happened during the pandemic to your model and like the landlord situation. Yeah, it was, you know, I think everyone, especially last March and April, when things started shutting down nationwide, who knew how this was going to go? And we're still not out of it all the way. So, of course, we're still in the middle of it. But, you know, we saw, you know, traditional salons operate on a pretty low profit margin because they have a lot of labor costs. And they're variable. And so it's very hard to, to profit strong profits in a traditional salon or spa. And so these, you know, these businesses were then forced to shut down just like we were for a period of time. But the difference was, is now when they reopened, a lot of them had occupancy restrictions, only half occupancy or a quarter occupancy for a long time. 
so then you have all these stylists and professionals who are also going, I don't know if I want to go back and work next to someone this close in a pandemic. Like, so what happened, there was this just traditional salons. Uh, there was unfortunately thousands and thousands of them that closed, but that, that was tens and probably hundreds of thousands of professionals that are now looking for a safer place to do business. And salon suites are really the ideal place. You're in your own room. You're in a confined space. It's you and one other person. You have complete control over the cleanliness, the sanitation. Um, and so we saw the, you know, as odd as it sounds, COVID ended up being one of the best things for this industry because it's, you know, the biggest problem I think we have right now, we don't have enough stores open be for the demand that's out there. Lead volume has, has gone up more than double. Leasing is at an all time high. The biggest problem is they have a supply bigger than, or the demand bigger than the supply. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other thing, Kim, that's awesome about this whole COVID situation is to Jason's point, we were scared at first, but let's think about all the small businesses that have had to close down all the brick and mortar buildings that have gone out of business, which there's been a ton, which is awful because that's the backbone of this economy is small business. But for us, that bodes extremely well because guess what? You can't import a haircut from China. You can't buy one off of Amazon. You have to go into a brick and mortar building. And there is so much commercial real estate online right now because there's just a lot of businesses that aren't going to have an office anymore. They're not going to have a space. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's awesome because our biggest cost of goods is your lease or your mortgage on your building, whatever you decide to do. And right now we're seeing deals we haven't seen. It's been since 2010 that we saw deals like we're seeing now. So you have like a demand bigger than the supply. We have landlords super yeah. aggressive to like re-rent these spaces from companies that have decided to just go virtual forever. And so what does that mean to your franchise owners who are, when they're open, how fast they're getting them rented and the margins in their business when the rent is cheaper or they got free rent or they get yeah. free TI yeah, money. Yeah, we're, we're actually building a corporate store right now in Salt Lake. Um, we, before we broke ground on the building to start the remodel, we had a hundred percent occupancy. Um, we have stores in Texas, uh, that are opening at 80, 90% occupancy. Um, a lot of the new stores coming online are, are breaking records all across the country. Um, you know, and that's where this, this, and I'll, and I'll give you just some high level overview there's about 1.3 to 1.4 million professionals in this country who are in beauty. Um, about five and a half percent of them are in salon suites right now. So when people look at any market and go, well, there seems to be a lot of salon suites around. It's like, like you said, there's only 25 to 30 people in each one. There's thousands of professionals in every city, but right now only just under 6% are in salon suites, but one third of that entire population of beauty professionals uh, booth rents at a salon. So they're already independent. They're already paying rent for a chair, but instead of getting a room, they just get the chair. Those are the people that are migrating. So salon suites have an enormous growth trajectory over the next 10 years. There's estimates that there might be anywhere from four to 7,000 more, uh, salon suites that open up, which would then put the total saturation concentration at around 15% of the industry, which is still not that much, but that's still the amount of growth just over the next 10 years. This is really changing the salon world, traditional salon world, and this is really becoming the next, the next evolution of what the beauty industry looks like. I don't think everyone will be in this at the end of the day. There will always be people who will be at traditional salons. But this is definitely going to be a game changer for beauty. For those experienced stylists who have a full book of business and loyal clients who will follow them pretty much, you know, within reason where they move to, this is going to make sense. But there's, like you said, there's always going to be a need for the, the other salon for people coming right out of beauty school who don't have clients, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, makes it's awesome. So what have we learned here today? I have learned, and I, I sort of already knew this, but I just love hearing it firsthand. Entrepreneurship is very lonely. Franchising is collaborative. Every franchise business starts out as a startup business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the story that was shared here today, right? People forget that, right? In every business, 
it's an ongoing evolution. It's not a one and done. Like we figured out the model. It's like there's ongoing research and development that's offered in a franchise that you, as the investor, don't have to worry about. Jason and Sean are taking care of that for you when you're a franchisee with them. You just get to plug and play in this model. You know, I have a lot of fran a lot of videos on this YouTube channel about how business in a box is so misleading in a franchise. And, um, but this one really is almost business in a box. I mean, yeah, every business needs an inspired leader who can, you still gotta get the spaces filled. You gotta, people want, have to wanna rent from you, right? So you still have to do that part. But once they're in, it's an investor's model. This is not buying yourself a job by any means. Such a great story. These guys have hit their stride. The financing is the best it's ever been. I've placed a lot of people in into Image Studios through the years, and it, it's not always, it hasn't been an easy path. And I anticipate that the next 100 units are going to go a heck of a lot faster just because the opportunity will be viable for more people because of the financing situation. So if this is your moment and you're inspired, by this real estate play model, I absolutely want to meet you. Uh, before we close out the, the conversation, though, I do want to give Jason and Sean one final question. So Jason and Sean, you know, um, people in our lives don't always remember what we say, like our children. <laughs> they don't ever remember what I say. <laughs> but they typically remember how we make them feel. And I know that you guys have a huge heart. You have a family of franchisees. I hear it. I hear it from the candidates that I send to you who validate to the people who've been welcomed to your home, Jason, for the discovery day, you know, meal or the, the, din the night before the discovery day event. It's just unbelievable. So the question I have for you is how do you hope to be remembered by your franchisees who have invested and will invest in your franchise? Um, that is a good question. You know, I think at the end of the day, I think what, what our success has been though, is when, you know, when we work with people, we're connecting with them genuinely, right? Like we want to know their goals, their, their growth plans. Um, we want to help them set goals because we, I think we want to be remembered as helping them get to where they want to go. Right. Because what I've always found, it's, it's a lot easier when you help others, you help yourself. And mm -hmm. so rather than just trying to help ourselves, we want to help others get to those dreams because that ends up working for everybody. And I think it's just to, to know that if we can help play a part in someone's change in career or growth trajectory or their overall wealth strategy, that would be, you know, an honor because I think that's to where that makes an impact for their quality of life, their family, um, their legacy, and those kind of things. I think is, you know, that's priceless. So another franchisor who genuinely cares about their franchisees. Do you have anything to add to that, Sean? I mean, it, I mean, you kind of hit it on the head, but I would say anytime you empower somebody and you enable them to better themselves in their life, I mean, our core values are creativity, freedom, and success. And that's truly what we feel like this business model brings to people. Um, that's why we, once again, at that pivotal moment, when we had our fifth location, we decided this is where we're going to focus our energy because this is the end game, right? This is going to give us the freedom and success and creativity that I think everybody truly wants. Like it's, it's really fun to be creative and have freedom and be successful at the same time. So that number one, number two, empowering people is, it's such an amazing feeling. This is something we didn't even understand about this business when we first opened our first location. But after the first location filled up in six months, we had people coming to us crying because we had literally changed their life. I mean, when you double your income as a professional, I don't care if you're making 20 bucks an hour or 20 grand a month. If you double your income, that is a massive lifestyle change. And when you empower women and especially minorities to be the best literally version of themselves, that's the most fulfilling thing to me about this business model. Um, but how do I want the franchise? To feel? I want the franchisees to feel the same way, right? I want them to feel like they've been empowered and we've enabled them to literally live their best life. You heard it here on Kim Daily TV. I really, really appreciate your time, Jason and Sean. And I'm telling you one day I am going to meet your mom. <laughs>
Whatever. You're lying. You're lying. Kim Bailey bucket list. I want to know the woman behind these two men. <laughs> hey, I've been telling my mom about you, Kim. I've been telling her all I'm about cry you. With her, <laughs> laugh with her and mostly just hug her and pat her back. <laughs> I keep love it, your mom. I don't even know her. <laughs> you guys are amazing. I love you. I love Image Studios. For those people who are inspired by this video, if you would like to learn more about this salon suite opportunity, I absolutely want to be your daily coach. Please leave a comment below or reach directly out to me on my website, thedailycoach.com. Until next time, don't forget, I am your daily coach right here on Kim Daily TV. Mm -hmm.